I'm Stu Bailey, the curator here at Wings Over the Rockies Air and Space Museum. And in this episode, we're going behind the wings of a supersonic carrier-capable fighter designed for air superiority and fleet defense, the Grumman F-14 Tomcat. We'll explore the aircraft's history and take an up-close look at its design features. And to make this episode even better, we are going to be talking with an F-14 pilot who will share his stories of what it's like to fly the Tomcat. All of a sudden you see this missile, you know, joining up on you on your wing almost, coming up underneath your nose, and then it felt like it was 10 feet in front of you, fly through the smoke trail, and then it just goes off into the distance. This one's gonna be cool. It's time to go behind the wings. Many people know the Grumman F-14 Tomcat is the star of Top Gun, but behind the Hollywood glamour was one of the most potent air defense interceptors in aviation history. The Tomcat story began in the early 1960s when Defense Secretary Robert McNamara pushed the Air Force and the Navy to share a common fighter. The result was the F-111. While the Air Force found success with its strike variant, the Navy's version, the F-111B, was too heavy and underpowered to defend the fleet. It was canceled in 1968. Despite the trend towards smaller, lighter fighters after Vietnam, the Tomcat was big. It was the largest, heaviest fighter ever to fly from a carrier deck. But its size delivered unmatched capability. Its radar tracked targets at extreme ranges, while its Phoenix missiles could strike up to 110 miles away. For closer fights, it carried the Sparrow and Sidewinder missiles, plus a six-barrel Vulcan cannon. Twin engines provided safety over open seas, while a radar intercept officer managed complex weapon systems, freeing the pilot to fly. With variable sweep wings, the Tomcat could go supersonic, up to Mach 2.3, yet still slow down enough to land on a pitching carrier deck. The first F-14 squadrons joined the fleet in 1974 aboard USS Enterprise, covering the U.S. withdrawal from Vietnam. In 1981, and again in 1989, Tomcats showed their teeth by downing Libyan fighters over the Gulfs of Sidra. During Operation Desert Storm in 1991, they defended Navy ships and equipped with tarps pods doubled as high-speed reconnaissance jets. The most combat-tested F-14s belonged to Iran, which bought 80 before the 1979 revolution. During the Iran-Iraq War, Iranian pilots claimed as many as 160 kills, although that number was likely exaggerated. The Tomcat continued in combat operations for decades, from Afghanistan in 2001 to Iraq in 2003, now dropping precision smart bombs as Bombcats. They also served as forward air controllers and photo reconnaissance platforms. Despite its incredible performance, time caught up with the Tomcat, and the Navy decided to retire the F-14, citing costs of operation and the diminishing need for a fleet defense interceptor. Tomcats from the USS Theodore Roosevelt flew their last combat mission over Afghanistan in February 2006, and by September, all Tomcat operations had ceased. The F-14 Tomcat wasn't just a star on screen, it was a star in the skies. Now that we've learned a little bit about the history of the F-14, we're gonna go talk with Tomcat pilot Mike Bonner, call sign Thumper. Start out, what brought you to the F-14 Tomcat? I was just drawn to airplanes, um, and I knew at eight years old I wanted to be a pilot, and I decided to go you know, the military route. And the rest was, I wanted to fly F-14s. From the day I stepped into flight school in Pensacola, I just always loved the fighter mission. A lot of hard work, but some luck too. Wound up getting out of flight school, F-14s to the West Coast. What was your impression of the Tomcat when you got to start flying it? It was really, really big. <laughs> I remember walking out the first time, you know, just to the airplane once I got to the uh, RAG, the training squadron there at Miramar. I mean, I couldn't wait to walk out there and just walk around it, you know, and look at it. And I mean, as soon as I walked out of the hangar, you know, just the size of it was remarkable, caught my attention. Once I started flying it, the other big impression was how fast the airplane really was. I mean, it's a big, heavy airplane, but it's still to this day the fastest fighter um, I've ever flown. When I first uh, started flying it in 1987, it was a transition from the Cold War long range carrier group threat. It was just such an adaptable airplane. It came in as really a platform to carry the Phoenix missile system, right, which was designed to have the fireball happen about 30 to 40 miles in front of your airplane. 
and then it went out as one of the best surface-to-air, all-weather, precision-guided munitions platforms that the military had. As one of the first class to get the F-14D, what was the difference you saw between the A models, B models, and the D? It was a completely different airplane um, for really uh, three reasons. Number one, the engines again, they were GE F-110s, but that was obviously one of the most critical things that the airplane needed. The radar, we had an APG-70 so we had a radar that was now um, capable of tracking airplanes as they went into the beam. We did not have that with the AUG-9 radar. The magic that Rios would work in the backseat of an F-14A or A plus or B with the AUG-9, I have the utmost respect for those guys and gals. I don't know how they do it. And then the fact that the airplane had a 1553 bus, it was digital. So we could put AMRAM and every other new technology weapon right on the airplane. And so it was truly on the inside, completely different airplane. We finally had a heads up display that we could use uh, in all areas of a flight, even using it not to spot the deck, but to help you on your approaches back to the boat. Taking off of the carrier, the catapult shots, what was that like with a big airplane like the F-14? Yeah. Overall, the cat shot was the one time that you are not in control of your aircraft. I described the whole catapult shot feeling as sitting in a stoplight, being hit by a car from behind at, I'm guessing, around 30 miles an hour or so. And that's what the initial impact feels like. That G-force just builds and builds and builds. And then as soon as you get to the end, it's just like releases. And that's where you gotta go, oh yeah, hey, I gotta fly this thing now, you know? What was it like for you with uh, landing the Tomcat? At night, period, good weather, bad weather, it was a lot of work. You were working so hard that sometimes you'd get out of the airplane, you know, once you're back on deck and your knees were shaking a little bit, you know? I thought I knew what dark was before I joined the Navy. You don't have any idea what dark is until you are in the middle of the ocean on a moonless night, no spatial orientation looking outside. During the day in good weather, coming in, doing a carrier break, you know, right in front of the bow of the ship and rolling out on that perfect, uh, you know, 45 second final and, and getting a three wire. There's nothing more fun in the world and so, so always fun during the day and just always challenging at night. In some of our previous episodes, we've talked to some pilots that flew aggressor aircraft in constant peg and you had a chance to fly against them. What was that like actually engaging the types of airplanes that you would encounter? The constant peg mission that I flew was probably the most intense, eye-opening fighter missions that I ever flew. So obviously, highly classified back then. When I joined up on a MiG-17 and a MiG-21, I realized how incredibly small they were. It was just an incredible experience because you had studied those airplanes. They were in a certain category of airplane and you knew their, their performance numbers in the book, but then to join up on them close range, they actually had you do this drill where you would just change your aspect on the airplane or your azimuth on the airplane and the adversary pilot would tell you, yep, I can see you, I can see you, no, I can't see you. And so you learned what, truly what the blind spots were for a MiG-21 pilot or a MiG-17 pilot. I mean, that kind of stuff is just priceless, right? To actually see what that looks like from your cockpit. And then you got to do a couple of dogfights against each one and employ the game plan that you had for each airplane. The most important thing is to maintain sight, right, of your adversary in a dogfight and how incredibly hard that was. Um, the minute one of those airplanes started to get nose onto you, they would literally disappear if they were anything more than um, a mile away. So to have that experience and do that was absolutely amazing. How was the F-14 as, as a maintainable platform? It was a challenge. It was always a challenge. The airplane had a lot of hard to get to sections in it. You kind of had to be a gymnast, I think, sometimes. The airplane in the early days, there were still some chronic systems, right, or systems that had some chronic problems. Probably one of the biggest ones was the ECS, the Environmental Control System. When the airplane first came online, the actual compressor or ECS device, that turbine had a tendency to fail and throw its blades, and it sits back in the turtle back behind the canopy as it, as it slopes down into the fuselage. And right alongside it and right on top, are the hydraulic lines running back to the horizontal stabilizers and the rudders. And so, yeah, there were a handful of airplanes that we lost when the ECS turbine uh, failed. So that was a system that they were always 
working on. It got fixed, you know, over time. But uh, yeah, that was a chronic system. The radar was old technology radar, and I think that system took a lot of maintenance hours. So a lot of work to keep the airplane, you know, flying, um, you know, every day. But the maintenance crews were just absolutely amazing, um, especially the more experienced maintenance chiefs. And I think our avionics techs were just the best in the world. We've got some great information here about the airplane. Let's go take a look at it close up. We're up here at the cockpit side of it. Tell us a little bit about how was visibility for you in this aircraft? It was amazing. Yeah, this airplane had great visibility. You could see the big bubble canopy. No restrictions anywhere, really. If anything, the biggest obstruction was just over the nose because the nose is kind of a little bit long. The airplane at the time didn't have the technology to have a, a, a single front windscreen, right? So we do have the bow in the front windscreen there or the metal frame but it never impacted my forward visibility. And the best thing about it was, again, you had that second set of eyeballs in the back. That backseater could crane his you know, neck to truly see down the back side of the airplane. And on this side of the aircraft, you had the aerial refueling probe. What was that like? It's a little different than the Air Force style. Refueling probe sits right here behind this door. So when it comes out, it's kind of at an angle. So it was nice because you're looking you know, at it in front of you out the right side of your windscreen. But I just mentioned the big bulbous nose. So as you would approach the basket, after you're done setting yourself up in the right formation on the taker, you got to go and fly that probe into the basket. So as it's getting to within about 15 feet of your eyeballs, you know, 10 feet from the from the tip of the probe, it starts crossing the, the thicker part of the nose and, and the basket would always start moving out. So you just got really good at number one, controlling your closure, right? If you got too fast, you're gonna either hit it too hard or miss it and go too far forward. But also, um, if you rolled the airplane a little bit, um, it would take that probe and actually kind of lift it up a little bit. Or if you rolled back to the right, you would get it to move further out laterally, right? So you just got really good at really small corrections to um, account for that basket moving as you got closer to it. Mike, we've talked a lot about flying, but uh, this is a weapon system. And let's take a look at uh, some of the different capabilities of the aircraft. You started with a fighter pilot's favorite weapon, which is the gun. This gun was very reliable, a lot of fun to shoot. <laughs> it really shook the airplane pretty good, and it's only firing a 20 millimeter you know, round, but the fire rate was just absolutely amazing. That's at the core of the airplane in the fighter mission. But what was cool about this airplane, it carried three different ranges of air-to-air -air missiles. First off, the airplane was built around the AIM-54 Phoenix missile, right, and that AUG-9 radar weapon system. And the missile fell away first, and you felt that because it was so heavy. The rocket motor would launch, and then the missile would do what's called an MBAM maneuver, main beam avoidance maneuver. So. First, you think it's not working at all because there's this, you know, what feels like 10 seconds of silence. Then all of a sudden you see this missile, you know, joining up on you on your wing almost, coming up underneath your nose. And then it felt like it was 10 feet in front of you. It was, it was out in front of you. This huge white smoke plume fly through the smoke trail. Um, and then it just goes off into the distance. Pretty impressive weapon suite on deployment. We carry two AIM-54s in the belly here. And then we have two AMRAMs on the inboard weapon station on the wing, and then the sidewinders are on the outboard. So 2-2-2 two, two, and two is our typical loadout. Well, since we're here actually by the wings, that's one of the neatest thing about this airplane is its variable geometry wings. So why don't we go upstairs to the balcony so we can look down on it and talk about those. With the wings swept in oversweep like they are right now, the airplane is basically twice as long as it is wide. With the wings in full forward sweep, the airplane actually has a longer wingspan than it does fuselage length. So obviously a huge performance advantage in an air combat maneuvering environment. One of the bigger advancements we had was our wing sweep system, we operated it automatically from takeoff to landing, basically. There are actually airbags underneath the part of the movable wing that joins the fuselage. So I thought it was pretty mind-boggling to have a supersonic fighter aircraft that goes close to Mach 2 that has airbags on it. So pretty amazing um, design for its time again. We could take over manually anytime we wanted to, sweep the wings back to give our adversary or opponent the appearance that we're going a lot faster than we really are. Because that's basically how it worked, right? The faster you went, the more the wings would uh, sweep back. And then as the airplane slowed down, the wings would sweep back forward. We could talk about this all night and Me I'd too. love to, but from your 
perspective as an operator, what do you think the legacy of the Tomcat is? I think it will be remembered as a game changer in the air defense, air combat maneuvering environment. At the time it was introduced into service, there was not another airplane like it that had the advanced technology. Our adversaries had airplanes that were as fast or faster, but once you got into a maneuvering environment, they were like flying bricks. This airplane, with its speed and its range, could set that shield up so far out in front of the carrier battle group that uh, it made wartime operations, right? If we ever had to go to war, gave us, and I think the battle group, a lot of confidence and, and sense of security, knowing that that first line of defense was an airplane that was way out outside of the carrier battle group and then had a missile that could go another, you know, 80 miles if it needed to to defend the battle group. Well, Mike Thumper Bonner, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure, a lot of good stories here, and uh, we really appreciate you being with us today. I appreciate the time. It was great talking with you. Appreciate everything that you do here at the museum, so thank you very much. We couldn't cover everything in this episode, so if you have comments or questions, leave them under the video below, and we'll get to as many as we can. Come see us and check out the Tomcat and all the other carrier-based aircraft that we have on display. We've come to the end of the video, and at this point I want to say, if you're a subscriber, thank you. And if not, just subscribe already, okay? Well, I gotta get back to work, so we'll catch you later. Bye.